بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد Just to recap, we were discussing circumstantial deen, deen which is based on certain conditions. One is the time, for example, a person becomes religious, dindar, when it is the day of Jummah, when it is Ramadan, one was placed, a person becomes pious, they do ibadah, they excel when they in Mecca, Medina, Hajj, according to the place, etc. One was with regards to a person, when a person when somebody is in somebody else's company, they sheikh, they ustad, etc, etc. Then they pious, then they abstain from guna. The fourth one was condition. A person turns to Allah when halat are there, when halat in conditions are gone, then they forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're busy with the fifth one, which is routine, where routine comes in our ibadat, in our amal, in our daily life. And we lose the nur, the essence of that ibadah. This is the fourth part of that routine. So, if there was an opportunity or a time for a person to perfect amal, then this is the best time. And if we analyze also different times, different situations, we Allah's the jelly special nuris, we'll see a person can do more than what they normally do. If we think about Ramadan, how we manage the fast in a normal time, we will struggle. Likewise, how do we manage the rawi? How do we manage to make till out of Quran? How do we manage to do all our chores? Ask a person who goes for Hajj, how does he manage to walk the distance? He, he, he cannot believe it in his wildest dreams. How did he manage to do so much? Ask a person who's made tawaf in the month of Ramadan, in the hot sun, during the day. Normally, just to walk out on that, when you leave in your hotel room, just to walk from the hotel to the haram is so difficult. How do we manage to make that tawaf? So when Allah subhanahu wa special tajalli anwarat are descending, and as discussed previously, whether it's on a certain time like Ramadan, whether it's a certain place, the Baytullah, the Masajid, etc. Or a certain amal, each amal has a different nur. Then a person's ruh collects this nur and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in that person's life in all avenues. So the nur comes to him and that nur now transcends to other avenues of his life, whether it's barakah in risk, whether it is barakah in his time, etc, etc, etc. So all these amal has an effect, it has a power. There's nothing wrong with the amal. It's a problem with the amil, the person doing the action. For example, salt will have its bitterness, sugar will have its sweetness. Somebody was making a nice cup of chai, he threw the sugar, took the sugar jar through. When he drank it was very bitter, it wasn't tasting nice. So we went to check the sugar jar and somebody poured salt in the sugar jar. So it was labeled sugar but there was salt inside. So sugar will have its effect, but it's in the wrong place. So amal will have its effect, but me as a amil, a person making amal, it needs to be done correctly. The label shouldn't be incorrect. So when I'm doing this amal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded me to do this amal. And if I do the amal how it should be done, then Allah's help will be with me. So nowadays also, just a mindset, mizaj of Sharia. A person whose dunyawi problems are solved, he's happy. So for example, a person got a business problem, and we should do this, and we should be doing this as well. But the, the example being given is for us just to open our horizons and think deeper. So his business issue got problems solved, so he'll attribute it to Allah, Alhamdulillah, Allah has solved my problem. He had a court issue, he turned to Allah, his problem got solved. He was in a sickness, etc. Whatever issue a person had, financial problem, business was slow. Now he turned to Allah and Allah opened up a way. So he will say that Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always finds a way for me. But we need to think deeper. Because we we not in dunya to solve dunya only. 
Deen primarily was, we practice on Deen how Allah has commanded us. By practicing on this Deen, now Allah automatically will solve our dunyawi problems and akhirat problems. But primarily we want to sort our problems of akhirat. By the way, so as a Shaykh Rahimullah used to explain, he said, foolish is a person who buys a cow for the sake of the dung. So in India, other countries, we see um, people utilize dung for fertilizer, for fire, etc. So a person goes to the marketplace and buys the cow for the dung, we'll say he's very foolish. He said, intelligent is a person who buys the cow for the milk and automatically he'll get the dung for free. So if I get my akhirat right, I get my amal right, I get my taluk and connection with Allah right, automatically Allah will solve my dunya. He said, if a person asks for a glass, he'll only get a glass. But you ask for water, you'll get the glass worth it. So I'm asking for dunya, I'm not getting deen, I'm not getting akhirat, I'm not getting Allah. So that's a great loss. وَالْعَذَابُ الْآخِرَةِ أَشَدُ فَمَنْ زُحْزِيَ عَنِ النَّارُ وَتُخَلِ الْجَنَّةِ فَقَدْ فَازِ the criteria of success in dunya and akhirat is a person gets his deen right. So when our dunya issues are sorted out, does that register how, how much if I want to solve my problems of deen, how much jazba and desire and ambition do I have for deen, the knowledge of deen. So how much every day do I take out time aside, example, to learn Quran with tajweed, how much time do I take aside to learn Masail? Basic Masail. It's the month of Ramadan. Did we study all the Masail of Ramadan? How a person does business to know the, know, know the Masail of business. Um, in the time of Maulana Ilyas, a traveler stopped at the local masjid and the young girl was playing outside the masjid. So the traveler read his salat, was having lunch and something got stuck on his tooth. So there was a, a jaru, a broom, so he went and to, to break one fiber from that broom because he wanted to take out a morsel that was stuck between his teeth. So when he did that, she said, Cha Cha Cha, what you doing? He said, I'm just cleaning my teeth. She said, do you know that that thing which is worked for the masjid cannot be used for private use? The broom is waqf, the fibers of the broom are waqf, you clean your teeth. So even a youngster, a small girl, in those days knew the Masail of waqf. How much Masail of Deen do I know? So how much we give, how much do we, of our time, our resources, our energy, our potential are we using? That's how much we will expound and benefit from that. Malana Yusuf used to say, Jo jis line se dena nahi janta, wo us line se lena nahi le sakta, nahi jan sakte. That that person who does not know how to take from a certain line a field, that person who does not know how to sacrifice for a certain field will not know how to maximize and take opportunity from that field. Whoever doesn't know how to sacrifice, for example, for his business. Now you have to be there at 8 o'clock, you have to close at this time here. If a person doesn't know how to give for that field, how will he take from that field? How will he take benefit from that business? Somebody has a profession. He does not know how to give time for his profession. So how will he take from that profession? Somebody has land. So if he knows how to give for that, to sacrifice for that, he'll know how to take from that. We haven't learned how to give for Allah. Ibrahim والسلام, his family was the ideal. When it came to him, Imam of Sacrifice. When he came to his wife Hajar, she was a, a lesson, a mother for the Ummah of Sacrifice. When he came to Ismail, an Imam of Sacrifice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then made Ibrahim والسلام, an Imam for the Ummah. That his statement was eventually inna salati wa nusiki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. That's our eventual statement. When you give sacrifice, 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 
then everything of mine, my loving, my dying, my eating, my sleeping, my walking, my everything is for Allah. So when you give for that line, now you give in for deen, you sacrifice some deen, now you can take from deen. So it's an easy formula. I'm giving for worldly matters, I'm sacrificing, I'm getting right, I'm getting the equation right. But for deen, how much am I giving? If I'm not giving, how how, how am I able to take and maximize benefit? Mona said, Khansa used to say, if you in anything, that thing will come into you. Whatever you in something, that thing will come into you. So he said, if a person is in the shop, all the shop will come into him. A person is in Deen all the time, so if you're making the effort of Deen all the time, then Deen will come in you. If you're in the path of Allah, the path of Allah will come in you. So whatever we are in all the time, whatever our external, that will become our internal. There was one bungi in the olden days, they used to have people used to clean toilets, and they never had the sewage system like we have today. So he was walking one day and he passed the Itar shop. So as he passed the Itar shop, the fragrance was too good for him, so he fell unconscious. So people came, they tried to revive him, they, they, they couldn't. One of his friends, compatriots, associates that he was working with, seen him, he said, Yetomara, Biradri, hey, this is my sati, let me go help him. So he went to go look for some dirt, some excreta, and he brought it close to his nose, and he regained consciousness. So he was so accustomed to that smell that it became his second nature. And he was so distant from the smell of perfume that it harmed him. So a person that's always in evil, in wrong, in haram, when haram is brought to them, they become vibrant, they become energetic. When tashkil, when, they are, when, when opportunities to do wrong comes close to them, they become vibrant and energetic. He was unconscious, he got conscious. And when good is brought to him, he fell unconscious. Means when those people who are involved in wrong, when you bring good to them, so a person is not ready for anything, his friends told him, one o'clock in the morning, I'm ready. In the middle of the day, in bright sunlight, while he's free, Jamaat comes and makes his smile, I'm far from busy, I got, I got no time, I got other important things to do. And the converse, a person is in Deen all the time. Now when the shield good is made, you are attracted, you, you want to do it more. And when evil is brought to you, then you fall unconscious. You stay far away from that, you run away from it. So we need to check to get this kafir, this condition of these amal, we need to check ourselves. What am I giving my time for? And what am I using my wealth for? And like that also we can check in different amal. For example, Tilawat of Quran. Somebody gets a letter from their beloved. First, when they just see the letter. Obviously in the olden days people had the ecstasy of getting letters, nowadays it's just text messages, it's, 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 a, it's a dead society. But anyway, he gets this letter, he looks at it, he embraces it, he keeps it close to his heart by his pocket, he doesn't open it. Then after a while he smells it, and when he opens it he doesn't shred it, drop it off quickly and just reads the message, no. And he takes time, he opens the envelope slowly. Then he takes out the letter, then he smells it again. And then he starts, after inspecting the letter, he starts each alphabet, each, each word is, is, is an ecstasy, it's a pleasure for him. So that's for dunya, for kalamullah, the word of Allah, I'm reading the word of my Allah, the creator of the entire universe, what kafiyat, what condition, the power of the Qur'an is what? لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلْ لَرَعَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَسَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشَةِ اللَّهِ It was descended on a mountain, the power of the Qur'an is, it would have shattered the entire mountain. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made Qur'an easy for the believers, he's made us hard, have the potential 
to the capacity to maintain and manage this Quran. Otherwise, even a mountain will become ashes, dust. This is the power of the Quran. يَتَفَجَّرُ مِنُ الْأَنْهَارُ That rocks can break, water comes out of it. But when the heart is hard, then this Quran will not affect it. It will affect a mountain. It will shatter a rock. But when the heart doesn't have the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Alam يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Has the time not come for the people who have brought Iman? أَن تَخْشَأَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ that when they hear the Qur'an, the, the, do their hearts not fear and shake and tremble? Such a powerful Qur'an and your heart has become so hard. Has our hearts become Qur'an proof? Has our hearts become zikr proof? Has our hearts become hidayat proof? So it will happen when a person commits a guna, a black spot, another black spot, Eventually, the heart is enveloped in darkness. So we need to be checking ourselves. A person is making dhikr. You take in the name of Allah. Somebody who's busy, engaged in something, he just hears the word Fatima. He stops on his tracks. That's his beloved. He forgets everything. He goes in a trance. I hear the name Allah. Allah. What does it do to me? In the olden days, poets used to write poetry. So a poet wrote a beautiful poem. The audience were thrilled. The king was perplexed and happy at the poem. The poet was given a bag of gold. He was thrilled and appalled by the prize. So the poet got happy, he benefited. The king was happy, he was praised. The audience were thrilled. But the poet himself spoke a lie. What he praised the king was a lie. So that was a lie. The praises was a lie. Everything was a lie. Everybody benefited. I'm saying Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. How many times in my salah do I say Allahu Akbar? How much if I'm reading Tarawi, I said Takbir. How much times we hear the Adhan, the Muadhin say Allahu Akbar. How many times in one day Allah is greater than every thought, every atom, every molecule, everything in the world. Allahu Akbar. Did the greatness of Allah enter my heart or not? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq of getting His greatness. The amal for today, yesterday we done to be particular about the four rakats before Asr Salah. The time after Maghrib is also a Mubarak time. We should at least read the six, six rakats of Awabin. If Allah gives tawfiq, then tell Isha, Man salla ba'da al-maghrib sita raka'atin lam yatakallam fi ma baynahunna That a person who reads the six rakats after maghrib and he doesn't speak to anybody. He will get the reward of thintay ash rata sana Twelve years reward of ibadah. Man salla ba'da al-maghrib ishrina raka'atin if Allah gives somebody to read 20 rakat, Allah lahu baytan fil jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build for him a palace in jannah. And it is said about Nabi alayhi salam, a sahabi as al radiallahu anhu, that I came to Nabi of Allah, we read Maghrib Salah, I was with him, fasalla ila al isha. He buzzed himself, tal isha. One scholar said, I went to visit Hazrat Shaykh once, Mufti Zain al Abidin, and I waited for him after Maghrib and he said what I read in Quran and Hadith I witnessed it with my own eyes. I seen him in sajda and I thought so he won't wake up something has happened to us a sheikh. And from the time of Maghrib till Isha he busied himself in ibadah. So whenever did I read a salat like that we need to think and the amal for today is the dua to read seven times in the morning and evening. Hasbi Allahu la ilaha illa huwa alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. Whoever reads the seven times in the morning and evening. Kafahu Allahu ma ahammahu min amri dunya wal akhira. Whatever concerns, whatever worries, whatever stress you have of your worldly concerns. 
and your akhirat concerns. And when we read in this dua, we must have yaqeen in this. Whatever concern, whatever grief, whatever worry, whatever stress, whatever problem, whatever anxiety I have of dunya and akhirat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will suffice for his needs. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.